Uh, I'm Patrick Lawrence, and I'm the editor for Scare Me. And uh, where are you from? I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri, now living in Los Angeles, California. How do you like LA compared to Missouri? <laughs> uh, it's it's a bit of a culture shock for sure. It's 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 way different. Uh, I spent thirty years living in St. Louis and got used to that Midwestern vibe, uh, and then moved out to LA. And the first thing I did was I came out to visit, uh-huh. and that sort of broke the ice for me. I remember the first time walking down Hollywood Boulevard, and, like <laughs> almost having a panic attack. <laughs> um, but now I go down the Hollywood Boulevard, and it's like, yeah, okay, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, whatever yeah. Uh, stupid, yeah. yeah it's fine yeah and it's funny because i've been telling people uh that uh i never really saw myself as a new york person i always considered myself more of a west coast person and at, uh when i went to new york for the first time i wasn't intimidated by it anymore and i think that's all from living in la because i could have never have done it you know just going to new york by itself but then having lived in LA for a while now when I finally did get to go to New York I was like oh yeah this is nothing <laughs> yeah LA will get you ready for anything you walk down anything. the street you're like okay just walk down the middle and hopefully you know, <laughs> I, I saw you have a lot of music video and short mm-hmm. kind of stuff going on yeah is, did that happen in LA or was that no that started in St. Louis oh, cool. um like I I, was, I played music for 10 years and when I decided to finish my degree in television and film production, I used my connections in the film industry to start get, or in the music industry to start getting going. And so I directed a lot of music videos and that really helped build up um, my work as editing and like familiarizing myself with it. And that just sort of segued into working with production companies in St. Louis. And they, you know, took me under their wing and mentored me to, into doing more narrative stuff. And so I, in, in St. Louis, the jobs are a little few and far between. So you might be doing short films one day, and then you might be working on a feature or you might be doing a political ad, or you might be doing an 18 wheeler instructional video. So it just depends. So it made me versatile as an editor. Even now, like I'm here with two films, I have a feature and I have a short doc. And the only reason I know how to cut a short doc is because I used to do all this promo work and I worked a little bit in reality too. So it's like, if I didn't have all of that, you know, knowledge, then I probably wouldn't be able to do it. That's uh, interesting because the reality stuff, I've worked a lot in that as well. And it's like, that'll prepare you for anything. Yeah. If you can get through that by yourself, I mean. Yeah, because and because people don't realize it, but a lot of reality, they call it non, not non-scripted, but it's it's fake, you know? And there's there's a story producer who's sitting there stitching all of the little bits and pieces together to t- still tell a story. And that's something that I learned um, because like I said, you're taking any job you can. Um, I... I was given a political ad and I didn't necessarily believe in the things that the, that the politician was talking about or the points they were trying to make, but I needed money. And so I, I basically figured out, it's like, okay, here's the story they're trying to tell. And if I can connect these dots, then it'll make a narrative here that they can use. That's a, so, that's exactly a good description of what an editor has to do sometimes. Yeah. Like, maybe it's not your thing, but if you can look at it objectively and see what yeah. you need to do. Find the story within the story. I that's, a, that's a great <laughs> skill. I know a lot of, re- re- when you're in reality, you are almost like a post-production director at, at times. Mm-hmm. Does, and you were able to transfer that to how you're working now. Do you think that helped you make a stronger voice in the edit bay or act, maybe just more confidence mm-hmm. to be like, hey, th- here's a cool vision, check this out. Do you see yourself doing that? I think you you, figure it out along the way because every director is different. So you never really know, like it's difficult because when you meet somebody, everybody's trying to give their best first impression because you only have one first impression. So when you meet somebody and they're like, wow, this is a really cool person. I'm really excited. I can't wait to work with them. You don't know until you get into the edit with them, how the collaboration is actually going to work. Um, I'm definitely not a button pusher. So don't hire me if you're expecting one. Um, I don't, I don't do that. Like if you are trying to hire me because you heard about good things that I do, there's a reason and you're going to get that reason when you're in the room with me. I, I, I'm not a yes man. If I think you're making a bad decision, I'm going to tell you why I think you're making a bad decision. I hear, I'm going to hear you out, but I'm going, I'm not, I never once set out to make a bad movie. And, and I like to think that my track record speaks for itself now, but I, I do that because um, I care about the projects because if I'm going to spend six months to a year or whatever on a project, I'm not going to do it and just put out trash. Like I'm going to put every piece of knowledge that I know about filmmaking into your film. Uh, And so that's why I like working with Josh Rubin on Scare Me was so great because 
Josh is somebody I respect the hell out of. He's got such a great career doing college humor stuff and television directing and commercial directing. And I knew when I got in the room with him that like, he's probably going to know more than I do, Mm. but I probably know a little bit more about editing than he does. And he knew that. And so our collaboration was perfect because Mm. I could tell him where I thought maybe this thing wasn't going to work, but then he could maybe what I don't know about comedy or, you know, he's really into horror. So it's like what I don't know about horror. It's like he could help get me a little closer to where his lane is. And that's great collaboration. It's just two people who have certain knowledges coming together and making one beautiful thing out of it. That's a great symbiotic relationship that you. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel about this film. Scare me because because I couldn't. I, every single time I start a movie, I ask for about six weeks to do a first cut. Okay. And what that does is it allows me to become familiar with the footage. I try to separate myself from anything that happened on set. Mm. Um, Cause I don't, any sort of misgivings or things that happened on set, I don't care about that. Mm. Like if you had a problem with your actor, who cares? Did he do the scene right? Cool. That's all that matters to me. Mm. But, um, but what I like to do is I can take that time and I familiarize myself with it. And then sort of construct what I think is the best version of the movie based on what was shot. Mm-hmm. And then when a director comes in for a director's cut, it's sort of inviting them in to see what I've created and then now try to get it sort of back to where they want it to be. Mm-hmm. So it's just sculpting away at the clay until we've actually got something that works. And with Josh, I knew that um, Scare Me was something unique because what's unique about our film is that we have our actors who are telling scary stories over the course of the movie and every single angle of the film, you could play that in a one and it was brilliant. And I'm a, I'm a minimalist at heart. So, you know, if I can do something in one cut instead of three cuts, Mm -hmm. I think it's better. Mm -hmm. And with this film, there's a scene very early on in the movie where uh, Josh's character, Fred runs up on the balcony. He's telling a werewolf story and he runs up up on the balcony and, uh, he's just performing. And I sat there and watched that whole performance in one take thinking, this is, I just do, I, this is unbelievable. And maybe I cut in some shots of Aya Cash, his character who's watching him. But then you start getting into the coverage and you start realizing, Oh no, no, there's so many more layers here. Mm. But as, as the characters themselves are becoming more and more dedicated to their stories throughout the film, so were the actors mm-hmm. and they were finding new ways to approach their performances. And so it became challenging to make sure that all of that was tracking as you're introducing new angles to make sure that like, as they're evolving, that it's not sort of, it's not going up and down and up and down, you know, throughout the film. So um, moving over to the kind of the technical editing side, are you, do you have an assistant editor or did you have an assistant? I did have an assistant editor on this film. Uh, His name's Jordan Thomas and he's here in Sundance (laughs) hanging out with us. And uh, yeah, with Jordan, I tasked him with helping organize everything in advance because, you know, I, I like to use, um, I actually do, um, my dailies and my transcodes through black magic cool. resolve, mm-hmm. uh, DaVinci resolve yeah. because, uh, a lot of times I need to split my workflow to where I've got dailies going out to the director mm-hmm. and then I've also got my transcode so I can cut. So it's just sort of seamless through there. So I take that and then I ingest it back into premiere and then I have Jordan make sure that everything that's not synced is synced and then go through and then start making markers. So I know where all of my actions are. And then I know where all of the little juiciest bits were. Cause there were a little, there were, I don't want to say a lot of improv, but things could get a little loose because mm-hmm. my script wasn't necessarily like the blueprint to the whole movie. It just kind of told me like where, where the stories would start and where they would stop and where huh. our interlude scenes would be. But in the stories themselves, the actors could play it a little loose. And so mm-hmm. that's where I wanted to make sure I had all my things marked. So I knew, exactly where to dive in and grab it that's great how how much time before you got it does the assist did your assistant have with it he only he only worked for about a week and a half uh organizing everything we started cutting scare me april 1st of uh 2019 and uh i think i was probably in it around the second week of april and then and then the interesting thing about our post-production is that i had to have surgery right in the middle of production so uh and it was in the doctor had given me like, it's either like the first week of May or it's the second week of June. And I really couldn't go another month <laughs> with the pain I was in. So I was like, we have to do it. And Josh was super understanding. Obviously it's not a normal ass to go, 
hey, I know you're working on your first feature, but yeah. I have to have surgery. Oh. And so I'm going to be out for a couple of days. But yet still, May 15th, he was in my home studio and we were cutting together. And uh, I couldn't I couldn't sit like I am now. I oh. was propped up a little bit, oh. but we were in there and we were working and we had and he was thrilled with my first cut and we were done with the director's cut um, by the beginning of June. And then we started doing test screenings in L.A. And then he flew to New York and we did test screenings in New York. And then we applied those notes and we were completely locked by the first week of July. Obviously, you've been you're an experienced sun dancer. So you see your cut in the we'll say the little screen in your, in your studio, you come here. Do you find yourself looking at things differently, no. even though it's locked, done, finished, colored, all the above? Yeah, of course. I, of course I'm sitting in the theater the other night watching the premiere thinking like, Oh, Ooh, okay. Hold on a second. That, that, uh, but I know I can't go back and, <laughs> and fix any of those things. But, but um, I think what, what's great about being in a theater is seeing the audience reaction because that's only something I can imagine in the edit. And so having been through it enough, I can anticipate where people are going to laugh and I know where to put my pregnant pauses. So that way we're, we're holding for laughter, but you don't know until you're actually in the room with people because you might have two jokes consecutive and the first joke lands and they completely miss the second joke. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're working with a comedy director, who's very precious about all of their jokes and this happens a lot on shorts where like where shorts you're, you get, you're compressed for time because you want to have a short that's under 15 minutes, but you want to keep those jokes coming. And the problem is, is that you might get that first joke and they completely miss that second joke. And so you got to make sure you have all those, all those kind of accounted for as you're watching the film. But what was fun about scare me that I had never thought of before is that the story of the film has our two actors telling scary stories for about a hundred minutes. Mm. And so what I didn't account for was bathroom breaks. So as soon as <laughs> as soon as one story would finish and we'd get to our interlude scene, all of a sudden I'd start seeing five, six people pop up and run to the bathroom and then get back as quickly as they could. <laughs> and I never thought about that. I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> like a natural pause. Like, all right. Yeah, they were just like, they could feel it. They were like, okay, that story's done. I gotta go. <laughs> oh, that's, that's really funny to see that in the theater. You're like, oh yeah. shit. That, that's You're used to like throughout a film, maybe, maybe one person gets up or whatever. But yeah, that was the that was the vibe the other night is that all of a sudden you'd start seeing a couple of people just get up and start running to the bathroom. <laughs> that is kind of funny. So how do you I mean, these days I get asked a lot about college and film school or as I like to say, me learning after effects on YouTube from a thirteen year old. Oh yeah. That's teaching oh, yeah, that hurts. 3D or whatever's going on. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on that? Do you tell if a kid comes up to you say, what do you think I should do out of high school? Do I go to film school? Do I watch movies? Yeah. Do, you know, what do you think? Yeah, I get asked that? it a lot. Um, I so Occasionally, I, I meet with people who are coming out of high school or people who are still in college getting ready to graduate. And I just tell them the same thing that, that I went through because I think there's a little bit of a, there's a mystique to like living in Los Angeles and everybody thinks like, I'm going to come out here and I'm going to get a job or so-and-so said they know so-and-so and they'll get me a job. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't work like that. And, and, and I'm brutally honest with them because that's what they need. You know, I unfortunately, um, I never bought into any of that stuff, but it happened to me. I was offered a job uh, when I was getting ready to make the transition out here. And I was working for a company and doing some little graphic stuff for them. And I was like, well, great. Well, I'll, hit, I'll go out there and I'll have a job right away. And I got out to Los Angeles in January 15th uh, and hit them up right away and said, Hey, you know, when can I come in and meet with you guys? And they said, how's February 13th. Oh, so it was like a full month. And then I went in to meet with the people who had already been working for. I've been working for them remotely for months and I go in and I meet with them and they're like, so yeah, we got a show that's coming up like in a couple months, but like, we'd love to have you on. Um, so maybe expect that to happen. Never heard back about that show ever again. But, you know, here I was not trying to fall into those trappings and I did. And so anybody that anybody that's like, you know, oh, you know, I'm going to move out there. So, so, so she knows somebody and they're going to help me out. Like, I just tell them, don't buy into any of that. Don't believe it. If it happens to you, great. <laughs> but expect two things. It's going to be a struggle. You're going to have to get your name out there. And um, it's going to take at least two years. Um, you know, I've had a couple friends who have had better success, but. You know, mostly I say it took me about a year and a half of planting seeds mm -hmm. and meeting people and doing good work to start seeing that pay off. And um, 
I first came to Sundance in 2016 with two shorts that I just helped some friends out with. And I thought, wow, this is going to launch my career. And it still took me six months. It was a dry spell for six months before I got my first big gig at Warner Brothers doing a show. And, uh, and that's, and I, I've, I haven't been out of work since. So it's been, I've been really lucky in that regard. 